All right. Well, thank you very much, Susan. It's a real pleasure to be at Chapman, and I have not been here a while. It's wonderful to see all the positive changes. Too close? Too far away? Oh, thank you. Yes. Yes, I have a little more height. So thank you, John. Um, so it's a, really, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning, and uh, hello to all of you in webinar land as well. Uh, uh, great to, uh, to be with all of you. Um, so my task this morning um, is to kind of give you the nuts and bolts, the basics of CEQA, kind of CEQA 101 as it affects historic resources. And um, I apologize in advance as well. Usually, uh, you know, preservation is a very visual, visually compelling medium. And usually when I do PowerPoints, I like to have uh, wonderful illustrations and photos of, uh, of historic places. Um, I think this is the only photo in my presentation this morning. It's really hard to uh, go through SQL guidelines and nuts and bolts and come up with appropriate images. Someone more creative than I can, can uh, spruce up my presentation, I guess, for the future. But this is a very text-heavy, word-heavy presentation. But um, I hope it's uh, informative, and I look forward to um, any of your questions um, along the way as well. So with that, um, Wow, I'm getting a lot of glare to be able to, I'll look this way instead. <laughs> um, so the basics of the California Environmental Quality Act, I think Susan's going to talk a little bit later about the federal environmental picture, NEPA, National Environmental Protection Act. Um, CEQA is really what is uh, one of many sort of little NEPAs uh, around the country, state level environmental protection laws that were uh, mostly enacted around the same time period, I think, uh, you know, beginning in the late 1960s, early 1970s, the first Earth Day was in this period. Um, so NEPA was 1969, CEQA followed soon thereafter. And uh, the purposes of CEQA were to prevent significant avoidable damage uh, to the environment, to foster um, informed public decision making, ensure transparency in governmental decision making processes, and encourage public participation. So I, I think all of these little NEPAs, all of these state environmental laws, really are ultimately about um, information, about disclosure, about transparency. They do not um, guarantee environmental outcomes, and we'll get more into that uh, in a moment, but it's about ensuring that those who are making decisions about um, environmental issues, about projects that might have an impact on the environment, have sufficient information and uh, the basis to make those decisions, and that the public has an opportunity to have that information um, and participate in the process. So, um, CEQA applies, first of all, to all uh, governmental agencies. Um, so uh, it is something that applies to uh, both public projects and uh, private development projects. Uh, and again, as I said, this is about disclosure and information. It does not uh, dictate a final outcome of a project. So you can still have a project that has um, an adverse environmental impact, as we'll talk about in a moment. Um, uh, and still have that approved so long as there is appropriate disclosure. One thing that's uh, important to understand about CEQA is that it also is multidisciplinary. It brings together um, expertise in a variety of um, impact areas. Um, I think that's one thing that um, for Susan or firms that, that do this type of work, the fact that it draws on um, an array of specialized expertise, cultural and historic resources are really just one of the multiple disciplines that uh, are included, um, traffic impacts, biological, um, air quality. Many of these are very specialized and scientific. Some of them are technical, like our work and cultural resources in other ways, but it brings all of these together in a multidisciplinary approach. And those of you that are EIR preparers or work in CEQA have to um, integrate these multiple disciplines. And uh, again, requires disclosure of environmental impacts and requires decision makers to consider the environmental implications of their actions uh, before they act. And historic resources, it's interesting. I, I'm often surprised that um, you know, many decision makers we deal with um, are themselves surprised that historic resources are so front and center as, in, in part of, as part of CEQA. It, it, it isn't necessarily logical that you think of historic resources as an environmental impact, but that has been the case 
uh, for decades now in CEQA. And in fact, the protections, the review processes that are available in CEQA are some of the strongest measures that we have to protect historic resources in many communities um, that lack historic preservation ordinances, that have weak historic preservation ordinances. In fact, CEQA is providing probably greater protection um, for historic and cultural resources than even our local uh, preservation laws. But uh, historic resources has been front and center as an environmental uh, consideration in CEQA for many decades. All right, so getting into some of the basics of when does CEQA apply? So the basics are that, first of all, you have to have a project as defined by CEQA. And uh, we'll get a little more into that. Um, CEQA apply, has to, applies to the whole of an action, the uh, activity approved by the public agency, not each individual permit or approval. So in many cases, there are projects that might require a series of individual permits, um, perhaps a demolition permit, a new construction permit, grading, variety of permits that might be required by a local government. CEQA requires that you look at the totality of the action uh, and do evaluations of environmental impacts at the earliest stage before you are considering um, a series of, uh, of future actions. The definition of a project is very much key to the definition of what is a uh, discretionary approval by a public agency. And I've put out put the entire text here. Discretionary meaning the exercise of judgment or deliberation when the public agency or body decides to approve or disapprove a particular activity as distinguished from situations where the public agency or body merely has to determine whether there has been conformity with applicable statutes, ordinances, or regulations. So this comes very much into play in historic preservation because much of what we deal with in the arena of building permits or demolition permits and the day-to-day -day work of local government may or may not be discretionary depending on the, the circumstances. There are many situations where um, a proposed, what would seem to be a project conforms with local zoning and just requires um, a look by a building official as to whether the proposal that's before someone meets local codes and they're able to look at the applicable statutes and regulations and determine whether it meets those codes. In those cases, you don't have true discretion. It really is just kind of checking the boxes uh, in, a in a much more straightforward way. Where you get into discretionary action is where some type of typically planning or zoning approval would be necessary, a change of zone, a zone change, a uh, variance application, or another application that requires either a public hearing or more detailed design review or more detailed consideration. Uh, by public agencies. So we're making a distinction here between discretionary actions versus ministerial, which are those kind of check the box type of reviews against codes, um, typically by a, a building official rather than a planning official. So a ministerial action, there's no real um, discretion involved or decision by the agency. CEQA does not apply to those ministerial actions. CEQA does not apply as well when there is no possibility of uh, significant environmental impact um, involved, or a uh, project uh, is uh, slated to be disapproved by the public agency. So if an agency is going to approve uh, a proposal that's before them, sequel review has to take place. But if uh, essentially the a conclusion has been made that a project is being rejected or disapproved, no CEQA is required. If the agency changes its mind or the decision makers change their mind, you have to go back and, and do CEQA before you consider approval in a situation like that. So a, a little more on discretionary versus ministerial. Here are some examples of discretionary actions, which include um, subdivision maps, uh, conditional use permits, zone changes, uh, the adoption of a new plan, a, a general plan or a community plan. Um, in your community, all of those would be examples of um, discretionary actions. Whereas ministerial actions would include most uh, building permits in most situations. And, and this is a source of discussion certainly with preservationists, but uh, in most cases and in most situations in most communities, demolition permits are likely to be ministerial unless there are 
thus you have a local ordinance that builds in some type of additional review or discretion. So this is important to point out that if you have a what what seems to be a project that conforms with all of your zoning, requires no other planning approvals of this type, we can lose, as uh, preservationists, we can lose significant historic buildings because there's no discretion involved in the process, that in many situations that can still be ministerial. It's not a project, and therefore CEQA does not get implicated in any way. CEQA is not triggered. Okay, the, in addition to uh, discretionary versus ministerial, um, there are other projects that are um, exempt from CEQA, and CEQA, uh, as a law, sets up two types of exemptions. It, it makes a distinction between what's called a statutory exemption, what's built into the, the CEQA statute. Um, these are granted by the legislature, by law, and there's a list of specific types of projects, emergency projects, for example, if there's a state of emergency, there's a st statute of, uh, there's a statutory exemption um, in that case. Um, and then there is a, a list that is determined and kept by the state resources agency of what are called um, categorical uh, exemptions. And there is, a, again, a long list of categorical exemptions, including existing facilities, replacement, uh, or reconstruction. Um, if you're going to use a categorical exemption um, as a lead agency, and we'll talk more about the role of uh, the lead agency, there are some additional requirements and you have to determine that uh, uh, it, uh, there are no unusual circumstances. For example, there are exceptions to the use of categorical exemptions. Um, here are some, uh, there's a longer list of examples of categorical exemptions, existing facilities, reconstruction, um, actions by regulatory agencies to protect the environment, um, inspections, accessory structures, minor additions to schools. Um, one thing I think I left off this list that's an important one is that there is a categorical exemption um, statewide for projects that meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. Um, yesterday, I believe, was your day. Uh, for some of you perhaps participated in the, in the day-long session here on the standards. And so it's important to point out that the standards are not only embedded in many of our local ordinances, uh, even though they kind of come down from the national level, they are a key part of how we do preservation at the local level. But as a result of that categorical exemption, and uh, as we'll talk about in a moment, the way we review impacts, the standards are very much um, uh, embedded in our way of doing CEQA review for historic resources in California. And so um, there is the ability to take advantage of an exemption if you have a project that uh, does conform to the Secretary of the Interior standards. Okay, so uh, let's assume now that you don't have a project that's exempt and you are uh, doing CEQA analysis. Uh, in that case, the lead agency, the agency that is um, um, overseeing the, the CEQA review um, on behalf of uh, a local government, for example, or uh, preparing a document for decision makers, the lead agency has a determination to make what type of environmental review is appropriate uh, based on the impacts of the project. Usually the, the first step is that the lead agency will prepare what's called an initial study to determine the levels of impact. And many of you who've worked in local government have probably seen these types of initial study documents. Um, you know, there's typically a, a checkbox, a series of checkboxes with different impact areas and narrative that goes along with that, looking at uh, what types of impacts uh, might be possible um, whether uh, an impact from that initial analysis appears that it could be significant, whether there's no impact, whether there is an opportunity to mitigate certain impacts based on that initial study. Based on that kind of first, first look, that kind of first cut in environmental impacts, the lead agency can determine whether there is no environmental impact, in which case a negative declaration or ND can be prepared. So a declaration that no, We've taken this initial look and we do not uh, believe there are environmental impacts. A variation of a negative declaration uh, or ND is a mitigated negative declaration or MND, and we have lots of additional acronyms to throw at you in CEQA as well. Um, 
an MND is a statement indicating that uh, there could be environmental impacts, but based on mitigation measures in the different impact categories, we are able to um, reduce those impacts below um, a threshold of significance, and therefore a mitigated negative declaration is appropriate. If, however, the initial study determines that there are impacts that cannot be mitigated <coughs> below a level of significance, then the responsibility of the lead agency is to prepare the fullest environmental analysis under CEQA, uh, which is an environmental impact report or EIR. And we'll get more into um, some of the requirements of an EIR in a moment. Um, <clears throat> to determine which category, which uh, environmental document is appropriate, it's uh, important to determine, uh, first of all, understand what is a significant effect. Um, a significant effect on the environment is defined as a substantial or potentially substantial adverse change in the physical conditions of, of the area that is uh, based on substantial evidence um, in the record. Substantial evidence meaning um, factual data, scientific data, um, not just uh, opinion and um, speculation. And significance is normally measured against existing physical uh, environmental conditions or uh, what we call the baseline um, in CEQA. So it's looking at uh, what are the uh, existing conditions today uh, versus what would the impacts be of the project. And this is actually a, a, an important point and something that does come up frequently in our work. Um, we're not looking at, uh, there are times when we would sort of prefer if we're doing policy work uh, for a city planning department like I do, that we'd prefer to look at um, the change in policy and you know what the impact might be based on the policy we have in place today versus a change in policy that we're putting in place uh, in the future in terms of additional traffic or additional air quality impacts based on what that change in policy would be. Um, because whatever's in place today would also allow for certain build out or certain impacts in a community. CEQA says that's not what we're looking at, that the baseline in fact is the um, existing conditions kind of on the ground today, not what could happen based on uh, kind of a regulatory scheme that's already in place. So that's, that's an important distinction. Um, often requires a more rigorous analysis because it really is looking at, again, kind of starting point is what's on the ground, uh, what's in place today. Okay. There's a concept um, as well in CEQA called the fair argument standard. Um, which um, in essence, uh, in many cases, kind of lowers the bar for making the, where you make the decision that an, an EIR rather than a, an MND might be required. Um, the fair argument standard uh, is that an EIR is required if a fair argument exists that a project may have a significant effect on the environment. Again, it comes back to that term substantial evidence. The fair argument, again, is not um, about just speculation, unsubstantiated opinion, but a fair argument is something that's backed by supporting documentation from experts, significant evidence, studies, um, something that is uh, much more substantial. And the important point of the fair argument standard is that it doesn't matter um, in, in general how much evidence is supporting the other side of the, of the argument, that um, you often have situations where there might be um, information in the record that there is no environmental impact. Uh, but if a fair argument has been um, su su successfully substantiated, um, the fair argument standard indicates that an EIR is required if that fair argument test has been met. In preservation, th where this comes into play frequently in our work is kind of the, the dueling experts, uh, the situation of um, competing experts on the significance of a historic resource. And we have uh, professional historic preservation firms um, that are out there and frequently um, we might have a uh, historic resource assessment for a project that is meant to back up uh, a determination by a lead agency that there's not going to be a significant impact to a historic resource as a result of a project, either because the resource is not significant or in many cases that the, the project may not affect the eligibility of the historic resource. We'll get more into some of those subtleties in a minute. Um, so we have a report perhaps from a historic resource consulting firm 
we have another report from an equally qualified firm that uh, uh, kind of meets that fair argument uh, test, that it's a well-substantiated report uh, and indicates that there uh, appears to be a significant impact. The fact that there's a competing report on the other side in general wouldn't um, kind of cancel out uh, the, the report in that is trying to meet the fair argument standard. So again, I think this is meant to be in general a fairly low bar um, in indicating that an EIR rather than an MND uh, is necessary. Um, I'm trying to, I can't see the screen too well, and I don't know if it'll pop up there if there are no questions so far from the uh, folks in webinar land. If not, I'll go on. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Am I standing? Well, I fixed it. Thank you. Okay. I'll try to not move around so much. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So moving along. So um, back to the some of the procedural requirements of CEQA. Um, for a negative declaration or mitigated ne negative declaration, uh, the lead agency begins with a notice of intent to adopt such a, such a document. And this is typically a much uh, more streamlined process. So a 20 or 30 day uh, public review period. There's not a requirement with an MND um, or ND that there be a public hearing. However, there is always an opportunity for public comment. Again, CEQA as a public participation uh, requirement, a public disclosure um, law. So public comments uh, can must be considered. Must, must, there must be a public comment period, and the public comments must be um, considered by the lead agency. There is not a requirement for an ND or MND that there be a written response to each and every comment, and that's in contrast to what we'll see for EIRs. Um, so once the lead agency has considered those comments, um, they do become part of the public record. The lead agency and decision makers can move forward with project approval, and once they do so, can file what's called a, a notice of uh, determination uh, in Los Angeles County that gets filed with our um, county recorder's office. Steve, <laughs> So there is public notice uh, that goes out. So there's, um, uh, you know, in Los Angeles, all the, uh, I'm, I'm not sure how every city, there, there's a requirement for public notice. In Los Angeles, I think most of our interested parties know that uh, all of our public notices for our NDs and MNDs go in the Los Angeles Times on Thursdays. And so we have a long list uh, in the city of Los Angeles of all of our environmental documents uh, in the Thursday classified section, so with in very small print. So get on your reading glasses and look at all the, the fun MNDs and NDs that we're, we're doing in a given week. Uh, actually, the EIRs are um, noticed by that as well. And I think there's, uh, you know, most communities have a kind of a publication of record where you'll see those, those notices. Um, so that's the process for uh, the MND. For EIRs, and I, I wanted just to cite here uh, the uh, kind of a significant court decision, um, the Laurel Heights decision going back to 1993 that called the EIR the heart of CEQA. And I think the reason for that certainly is that the EIR has the fullest informational content, the fullest informational requirements, um, and you know, obviously the most detailed analysis for the public and for decision makers. So the requirements of an EIR are spelled out in some detail, it has to be a, a project description, again, that describes the totality of the, um, of the project. Uh, if there are kind of a series of subsequent permits that are required or a series of zoning um, actions that have to take place, they all need to be wrapped up into that single project description um, in the EIR. There's a discussion of significant environmental impacts um, and an analysis of those impacts measured against that baseline, those existing conditions that we talked about a moment ago. Um, that can be a very substantial, it's, you know, it says discussion here, but uh, uh, that can be uh, you know, a very substantial analysis. There are EIRs, there are very focused EIRs that are relatively slim, but we see um, EIRs in the city of Los Angeles that can be multiple volumes, hundreds of pages. We've had EIRs that are thousands of pages that have detailed technical reports behind them 
and a discussion of environmental impacts and analysis of those impacts um, in each impact area, whether it's air quality, toxics, cultural resources, um, traffic impacts, and so on, that you know, it's, a, it's a significant chapter for each one. Part of the heart of CEQA and, and really one of the areas that are most significant to historic resources is the discussion of alternatives to the project. And this is, I think, in many ways, for those of you who are preservation uh, advocates, um, participating in the, C in the CEQA process as members of the public, this can be an area that is most um, useful to you. If it's a project that has, uh, is um, stated to have significant impacts to a historic resource, there's a requirement to look at a reasonable range of alternatives, and we'll talk more about that um, in a moment. And that, but that gives you an opportunity to look at preservation alternatives, to look at partial preservation alternatives, or a range of options that uh, would avoid that impact, um, and also be um, kind of a rallying point for preservation advocacy and an opportunity to bring the public in for discussion of those alternatives. In addition to the alternatives analysis, there's a requirement that the EIR look at mitigation measures, ways of offsetting those impacts, minimizing those impacts, um, either to uh, below a level of significance, or if not, to at least minimize uh, the impacts as much as they can be. And we can talk more, and I know you have a lengthier discussion today on, uh, on mitigations. And discussion of what are called cumulative impacts, uh, a recognition that um, in some cases, uh, a project alone may not have a, an impact uh, at a significant level, but taken together with a variety of other related projects in the same community um, or you know, nearby areas, um, taken together that there could be significant uh, impacts. All right, so mitigation and alternatives, again, for pres the preservation uh, side of CEQA, this is really uh, key and uh, the CEQA guidelines state a public agency should not approve a project as proposed if there are feasible alternatives or mitigation measures available that would substantially lessen any significant effects that the project would have on the environment. So this kind of this groups alternatives and mitigation measures together. We'll break them apart a little bit. A mitigation measure is an action or change to the project that reduces or avoids some impact on the environment, including actions that completely avoid an impact. A mitigation measure must be devised for each significant impact that is um, identified in the EIR. Mitigation must be in enforceable, so it can't just be, you know, a hope uh, and, uh, you know, kind of put out there and so someone's going to do it. Uh, it needs to be enforceable. Uh, the responsible party for uh, carrying out the mitigation needs to be identified, so it needs to be um, so, you know, solid and clear in the EIR. It also needs to be roughly proportional to the impact of the project, so we can't impose on uh, new development. Let's say there's a traffic impact at a local intersection. Um, you know, we can't uh, impose on a single project uh, a requirement that they uh, build out an entire new rail system or a, a, a freeway interchange uh, a mile away, um, you know, they might be able to um, mitigate that impact through what we call transportation demand management, trying to take trips off the road or to uh, do signalization improvements at that intersection, to do something that is proportional to the impact that is caused, but not impose on new development. Uh, responsibilities that go way beyond the impact that that project is causing. And there's a lot of, uh, Susan considered a lot of court decisions and uh, legal background to that principle as well. And in general, um, deferred mitigation is not permitted. So it is improper to defer the formulation of mitigation measures until after project approval. The mitigation measures need to be identified in the environmental document. This can get tricky and I think um, you know, I think all of us who work in CEQA often fall into the trap of perhaps um, going down a path of deferred mitigation in terms of preservation, that, that it's easy to do that, you know, ensuring that there's going to be some level of additional design review or project review after a project gets approved. That's possible to some extent, so long as you've ensured that the actual impacts are mitigated through other uh, processes up front. Uh, as part of the environmental review. So that's something that you need to watch out for is to avoid deferring your mitigation. 
So that's mitigation. Now alternatives, the requirement is that an EIR shall describe a range of reasonable alternatives to the project or to the location of the project, which would feasibly attain most of the basic objectives of the project, but would avoid or substantially lessen any of the significant effects of the project and evaluate the comparative merits of the alternatives. So this is saying that the requirement in EIR you need to have this reasonable range of alternatives. So typically that would be more than one. Reasonable also probably means fewer than, I don't know, 10. <laughs> Usually we see a reasonable range being a few. Um, that uh, in, in dealing with preservation impacts, that would typically mean uh, if a project is to have a significant impact on a historic resource, almost always, one of the alternatives is what we call the no project alternative, uh, that just the project is not going to be built as proposed. Almost always on a preservation related EIR, you're going to have a preservation alternative that uh, one that meets the Secretary of the Interior standards as a starting point, because that's our basis for ensuring that there's no um, environmental impact. Um, and often you'll have a, a range of other options. One of them could be, it talks about uh, alternative, about the location of the project. Maybe some of the program gets accommodated on an alternative site nearby or uh, an, you know, another property. Uh, maybe there is a partial preservation alternative. Um, we see uh, facade only preservation alternatives where uh, you know, just a, an exterior gets retained and the interior uh, gets um, kind of blown out or proposed uh, largely as the, as the proposed project suggests. So you know, we're, typically we're looking for a reasonable range, no project, a preservation alternative, and then maybe something uh, in between to give the public and decision makers that kind of reasonable range of options. And then a disclosure of what are the impacts um, under each of those alternatives, um, which of the project objectives are met, um, and which are not. So um, what are the appropriate alternatives? Uh, I talked about the no project alternative. A lead agency must include only feasible alternatives. So it is possible to reject the possibility of certain alternatives, and you usually would discuss this in the EIR. Often you'll see a section that, uh, dis that discusses um, alternatives that were considered but rejected because they were determined to be infeasible. So it is, it's not a requirement that you fully study infeasible alternatives. Alternatives um, should be, um, must include those that would achieve most of the project's basic goals of obje and objectives. Alternatives should be reducing at least one impact. So it's really not enough to just say, this is a, here's another alternative, but it has the same adverse environmental impact as the, as the proposed project. The purpose of the alternative is to try to uh, mitigate and reduce, uh, reduce impacts. Um, and that the range of alternatives is governed by the rule of reason. So again, there's not a requirement that, that you produce a, an unreasonable array of, uh, of every alternative uh, under the sun. Um, actually, let me just go going back to alternatives for a moment. Um, so uh, again, I think the, the selection alter of alternatives is really key and particularly for um, uh, historic preservation uh, options. And I, I think, as I mentioned earlier, this is the opportunity as well for uh, advocates and for members of the public to put forward your own ideas in participating in the project, uh, what you would consider to be potentially feasible alternatives, whether it's an alternative to demolition or a project that might have an, an adverse impact. Um, it's because alternatives th then get developed in the EIR and you're looking at how they meet or don't meet project objectives, this is really where uh, there's an opportunity to have that much more detailed evaluation of the project against other possibilities that would uh, lead to a preservation solution. One thing that to watch out for, I think, as a lead agency and something I have to caution uh, even our staff in Los Angeles about and, and the role that we play working with our client staff that does environmental documents is not to accept um, environmental documents that have project objectives that essentially foreclose preservation alternatives. We see this quite a bit where perhaps a draft from an environmental consultant might, might say, uh, the goal of the, uh, the goal or objectives of the project include um, uh, 
clearing away dilapidated structures on the site, um, providing um, you know new state of the art uh, construction on the property, w wording like that. Um, you know, there is no way a preservation alternative could meet the project objectives. Uh, we would really I ideally prefer much more neutral project objectives that could speak to economic revitalization or provision of new housing, a variety of things that could, uh, uh, you know, prior project goals that could be met by either a uh, historic rehabilitation project or by new construction, but avoid kind of crafting your project objectives in a way that makes the alternatives analysis uh, meaningless and really uh, creates an unlevel playing field for historic preservation alternatives versus new construction alternatives. All right, let me move along. Public participation. Um, public participation is again key to the CEQA process and there are opportunities for public participation every step of the way. There are two main opportunities uh, for comment, both um, uh, during the comment period on environmental documents and before the close of the hearing on the project. In many cases, uh, a lead agency will hold what's called a scoping meeting, uh, which is a public meeting to provide an opportunity for comments um, early on as to what the scope of the environmental document should be, in what impact areas members of the public feel uh, th there may be significant impacts and therefore what should be studied um, in the EIR. Um, there's not a requirement for a public agency to actually have a scoping meeting of that type, but there is a requirement that there be comments on what's called the uh, Notice of Preparation, another acronym, NOP, as we call it, um, which is the start of the process, giving the public notice that an EIR will be prepared, and again, giving the public an opportunity to comment on what the overall scope of that EIR document should be. Um, so there are those opportunities to comment. Um, the public has an opportunity to comment on the approval of the project and the certification of an EIR by the decision makers on whatever type of project this may be. It's important to point out uh, that CEQA is um, ultimately um, enforced, if you will, through litigation. And uh, there is always the possibility, and we, we hear a lot in the news in California about CEQA litigation and in some cases sort of abuse of the CEQA process. And we do see this. Uh, and I'm a big believer and big supporter of CEQA, particularly the role that it plays in protecting historic resources in California. But it often is very frustrating that we do have parties, certainly in the city of Los Angeles and elsewhere, that use CEQA in, in, I guess I would say, an abusive way, or really are, are trying to extract funds from uh, developers, trying to kind of extort a financial settlement as the price for um, avoiding CEQA litigation, the long delay and uncertainty that that creates. We see that with a number of parties in our city, and it happens around California. But there is that possibility, and CEQA is enforced by that type of private action being taken. But it's important to point out that that can only happen, the prerequisite for a lawsuit, a lawsuit can only be filed if the party uh, bringing the challenge exhausts their administrative remedies. Uh, and what that means, I'll have the attorneys correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially those issues that are germane to the lawsuit need to have been brought up and raised through the um, public process um, in writing or in a public hearing uh, before the lead agency and the, and the decision makers. So you can't just go to court and file a lawsuit not having participated in any of the processes that are laid out for you in uh, the public participation components of CEQA. You need to have created that record and exhausted those remedies um, had the public agency declined to consider that, and you could then bring a legal challenge on those points. So the uh, EIR gets circulated for public comment, um, and the responsibility once a draft EIR is, is circulated, unlike an MND where comments are provided and the lead agency does not need to specifically respond to each comment, in this case, there is a requirement that the agency respond to each and every comment. And that can be a very laborious task for those firms that, uh, that do this work or for public agencies that have to do it without outside consulting firms. Um, you know, in many cases, we get hundreds, if not thousands of comments on um, some EIRs, and uh, some of these can be 20 pages, 50 pages. Each comment, uh, if you see an EIR, essentially gets cataloged separately. There's a, a comment and then a response to that comment substantively. 
um, by the lead, you know, by the lead agency, um, having to respond to all of those points. So that can be a very voluminous document. So that then gets folded into the final EIR. Final EIR really constitutes that original draft EIR, the comments and the responses to comments, bringing that all together for the decision makers to consider. And as part of the approval of a project, the decision makers consider whether to certify the final um, EIR, indicating that the environmental documentation is, uh, is sufficient. Um, and they make findings uh, concerning whether there are significant impacts in approving or rejecting the project. If there still are um, significant impacts that could not, those that could not be mitigated below a level of significance, and the lead agency wants to, uh, decision makers want to approve the project, um, they need to issue what is called a Statement of Overriding Considerations, or uh, another acronym, SOC, indicating that notwithstanding, we end up essentially that we understand there are significant impacts of this project in one or more uh, impact areas, the benefits of the project override those impacts, and they need to, to adopt findings indicating what those overriding considerations are to lay that out for the public um, and for themselves in some way as decision makers to um, you know, kind of rationalize. We understand that there are these environmental impacts. We are notwithstanding that uh, approving this project. Okay, so those are the nuts and bolts. Um, now I'm going to go on. Am I good on time? Oh, okay. Okay, because so th I, there was a lot to cover on sort of, sort of the basics, but how does this apply specifically to historic resources? Um, so key questions. Uh, it's really a three-part test in thinking about CEQA and historic resources. First question, does CEQA apply? Is it a project? We've talked a bit about that already. Assuming it applies, next question is, is there a historical resource as CEQA defines it? And then impact, if there is a resource would the project call, cause a substantial adverse change in the significance of the resource? And we'll go through these one at a time. First question, um, and we've covered this a bit, so I'll go through it quickly. The project is any activity that could cause direct or indirect change in the environment. It applies to discretionary actions, not ministerial. And again, the point that demolition in many cities when we're dealing with historic resources, and if there's not uh, discretion built into your local ordinances. In many cases, it is. Oh, you, so, oh, Christine, you okay? Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm so okay. All right. Um, so demolition is ministerial um, in many cities, not subject uh, to review. So let's assume that we do have a project that is discretionary. Um, the next question is: Is are we dealing with a historical resource? Um, in the CEQA statute and guidelines, the definition of historical resource includes properties listed in or formally determined eligible for listing in the California Register of Historical Resources. And note that that also includes properties formally determined eligible by, uh, for the National Register. Um, if you have, um, many of you are familiar and probably will talk a little in a little while about the Section 106 process. Um, and you have a um, property that is formally determined eligible for listing and you have concurrence from our State Office of Historic Preservation, at this point those properties are also listed in the California Register, are considered historical resources pursuant to CEQA. But those California Register level properties are not the only um, ones that are considered historical resources. So additional categories of historical resources include those listed in and adopted uh, local historic register. Um, city of LA, as an example, that means our local landmarks, what we call our city historic cultural monuments, or um, contributing structures in our historic districts, our historic preservation overlay zones. Those are all locally designated historic resources. Those are resources as defined by CEQA. But in addition to that, uh, it includes properties that are identified as significant in a historical resource survey, meeting some minimal um, state requirements. So we've just completed a citywide historic resources survey in Los Angeles we called Survey LA, as you heard in my introduction. And uh, we are treating those properties, at least there's a starting presumption that uh, properties identified as significant, as significant in Survey LA 
um, may be considered significant um, and historical resources under CEQA. So what we, we follow this last bullet point, that we treat these resources as significant unless a preponderance of evidence demonstrates otherwise, unless we have evidence that there were errors, uh, there's alterations, past demolition. We do leave ourselves open to receiving information on uh, whether there is a preponderance of evidence on the other side, particularly for our surveyed resources um, as, as a lead agency in Los Angeles. But our starting point is that if it meets one of these uh, bullet points above, uh, we're, the starting point is that we are dealing with a historical resource uh, under CEQA. But even if, uh, in addition to that, even if a property may not have been designated, it's not California Register or National Register, not identified previously in a survey, you're not off the hook yet. Um, there's still a possibility that you may be dealing with a historical resource. The lead agency needs to consider whether you have a historical resource in question as a result of, uh, of the project, even if they haven't previously been identified. So uh, I think this is something that many uh, local governments and many cities don't do. I think it was something you know in Los Angeles that I think our city uh, fell short on and until we really had a concerted historic preservation program and a historic resource survey, that it's not enough just to look at, is it listed? Uh, have we done a survey? You need to consider whether there's an impact nevertheless. And uh, when in question, um, either do a site-specific historic resource assessment or do some additional analysis to determine whether uh, a property may be eligible for historic designation and therefore may be historical resource. So now let's assume you've met that bar and you have a historical resource and then that triggers the third question. Does the project itself cause a substantial adverse change to the significance of that resource? And there's a lot there, both the question of what is a substantial adverse change and what do we mean by significance? So to break that down a little bit, um, substantial adverse change is defined as physical demolition, destruction, relocation or alteration of the resource or its immediate surroundings such that the significance of a historical resource would be materially impaired. Okay, so what do we mean by that? And what do we mean by materially impaired? That gets further defined. Significance is materially impaired when a project demolishes or materially alters in an adverse manner those physical characteristics of an historical resource that convey its historical significance and that justify its inclusion in the California Register, Local Register, or Historic Resource Survey. So clearly we're talking about physical change, demolition or alterations to a building or a site that altered those characteristics. Um, in historic preservation terms, we often talk about, and for the Secretary of the Interior Standards, we talk about character-defining features. To, so typically it really comes back to understanding what are the character defining features of your building or site and is the project demolishing or materially altering those character defining features that convey its historic significance those features that led to its being designated or being eligible in the first place for historic designation there's a subtlety here and something i end up debating quite a bit with land use attorneys and consultants i think there are some who would interpret this to mean that uh, you, you reach a material impair, uh, threshold of material impairment if a property, at, once a project is completed, is no longer eligible for designation. Um, and I think clearly that's the case, that if the project would um, eliminate the eligibility of that, of that property, clearly you have a significant uh, impact, substantial adverse change, that's materially impair, impaired. I, I tend to take the view that... Um, materially impaired doesn't necessarily mean you have to go all the way up to the edge of losing eligibility altogether. That if you are altering a substantial portion of the character defining features of historic resource, even though at the end of the day, you may retain eligibility, I think there often is a, a case to be made that that does constitute materially, <laughs> material impairment of the resource. That's a little bit of a subtlety there and something that you'll probably end up debating with your own um, land use attorneys and uh, preservation consultants um, in, uh, in your work, but just wanted to raise that. So if the project will not cause a substantial adverse change, let's say we have determined there is no material impairment and the character defining features are largely remaining intact, 
then you can go down the path of an MND or even a categorical exemption if the project does meet the Secretary of the Interior standards, as I mentioned. Um, CEQA, as I said, considers historical resource impacts to be fully mitigated if a project conforms to the standards. Um, however, the opposite is not always true. Um, that if you have a project that doesn't strictly conform to all 10 standards, that you may or may not have impacts rise to the level of material impairment, the slide I showed you a moment ago. I think you still need to look at, um, is there a physical change that is really significantly eliminating, changing those character-defining features of your property? So there are times when there's you know, maybe one of the 10 standards is not met or there's kind of questionable conformance with one of the 10 standards, you might still be able to get to a point where you're determining there's not a substantial adverse change, not material impairment of the resource, even though um, if you meet the standards, you're, you're good to go, essentially, in terms of CEQA. Um, so let's say you uh, have determined, though, you, you may have material impairment, you may have an impact, you have options to mitigate. Um, and I know you'll get more into mitigation a little later, so I'm just going to touch on it light, lightly here, that demolition, first of all, cannot typically be fully mitigated through mere documentation. And documentation, and we have a wonderful photographer here, and we, we, we believe in um, <laughs> you know, great documentation of historic resources, uh, but that alone does not compensate for the irreversible loss entirely of a, of a historic resource. That's been well determined in CEQA, CEQA case law. Um, a better option to avoid impacts is to reconfigure or redesign the project to avoid demolition or the major alteration um, of the resource. A frequent option that we look at if that is not possible is even possible relocation of the uh, of the resource to avoid demolition. There are considerations though with relocation, and this could be a, a, a longer discussion in itself. A new location should be compatible with the original character and use of the resource. Uh, the resource should be retaining its historic features as it gets relocated. It needs to be determined that relocation is feasible, technically feasible, and that uh, there won't be damage occurring in the process of relocation. Then you're also looking at the compatibility of its orientation, of its setting, and its overall environment, that that is compatible with its uh, historic character, its historic location. Without these mitigation measures, an EIR is required to study and analyze the significant uh, impacts. The alternatives analysis we've talked about and the feasibility of uh, preservation alternatives, so I won't touch on that again. And yes, that is it, and I'm happy to, do we have time for a few questions before we wrap up? Okay. Okay, just a reminder for everybody in the room is, um, because the people online would like to hear your questions as well, if you have any questions, uh, give me a few seconds to hand you a mic. Um, so I'll start with anybody in the room here. Ken, can you, you talk a little bit about the paradox of moving a building also being uh, an impact in and of itself? It's, it's not only sometimes it's a mitigation, but sometimes it's like, well, it, the removal of the building is in, in and of itself an impact. So now you're, you're mitigating a mitigation. Well, sure. Yeah, you have to look at this on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis and, and look at those impacts. I think this gets tricky as well. Um, you have to look at, as I mentioned, the compatible orientation and setting. Let's say one possibility where that could happen, let's say, is if you're relocating from a historic district into another historic district, um, where you're looking at the impacts of uh, uh, you know, the loss of a resource to a district, if, perhaps if it's a very borderline district in terms of its percentage of the number of contributing structures versus non-contributing structures, you're saving the building, but you're removing it from a kind of a sensitive historic setting. And you need to look at whether it's being moved into a, a district where um, uh, it's compatible with the period of significance for that district, the time period of development, the range of architectural styles um, in that district. Um, you know, if you're moving a uh, modernist uh, building into a uh, pure craftsman uh, district, uh, there's it's potential that, that that new building, even though it might have been individually uh, significant might be incompatible with the architectural character and the evolution of, of that district. So you have to look at these uh, very carefully on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Hi, I have a Survey LA question. Okay. I have a project on 4th Street. It's in a gray area that has not been uploaded yet to the Survey okay. LA website. <laughs> you have a very specific Survey LA question, <laughs> yes. Is there somebody that you can refer me to that can do maybe a record search? Because yes. Because I would love to be able to say, we check Survey LA. Yes. So I'll, uh, you can check with me, but Janet Hansen in our office, uh, we have all the data for that area. So Survey LA has been a huge data management challenge, and yes. so uh, much, most of the data is now online. Some of it is still being loaded both on our uh, website and what will be our comprehensive repository of all, and searchable uh, database of all this information, which is historicplacesla.org, to do a little plug for that. But uh, for the data that's not in yet, we do have it in-house, and Janet Hansen, who's been overseeing SurveyLA, can answer any questions and direct you to the detailed survey finding for that property. Can I get a contact after this? Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, and I'll start with one of the online questions, um, actually. Uh, the question was, um, how common is it compared to going forward with the project after the completion of an EIR uh, with... Uh, not doing the project? Well, I think if uh, someone is going down a path of an EIR for a project, that's a significant investment of time and money. Um, EIRs can cost, you know, 100000 to several hundred thousand dollars in, in many cases. Um, so typically, uh, if someone is going down the path of an EIR, they're understanding that they may have significant impacts, but they're going to invest the time and money to document that, to try to make their project more um, impervious to potential litigation or, or uh, community challenges. So um, typically at that point, uh, you know, they're committed to, to going forward. Now, there are times where the uh, decision makers, based on the uh, evaluation of the impacts, may choose to reject a project, more frequently might choose to um, select one of the alternatives that, uh, that minimizes uh, impact. But by and large, if a project applicant is going down a path of seeing their project uh, be subjected to an EIR, they're pretty committed. And unless there's an economic downturn, they're not going to uh, backtrack at that point just because there's a um, set of findings in an EIR. Great. Uh, that was the only question from online. So are there any others in the room? Okay. Um, oh, oh, there's one more over here? Oh, one more. Yeah. I just want to ask you a question. Is this information going to be available? Uh, either, uh, I know that you emailed yes, uh, uh, all, of, all the information from yesterday's. Right. It's a common question. So I will um, email out uh, PDFs of the slides for the speakers that are okay with me sharing their slides. No, uh, I'm happy to. And that's why, I, again, I erred on the side of being more explanatory on the, the slides, it, it, even at the cost of having very visually un uncompelling images today, <laughs> knowing that I think uh, it's a lot of material in a short time, wanted you to have that uh, as a reference. So thanks. Thank you so much, Dan. <laughs> All right, so we're um, running a few minutes behind, so we're gonna have a little 10 minute break. It's about 10.15 right now, so if we could try and gather back in the room by about 10.25. Um, there's coffee and pastries out in the hallway. Bathrooms are around this way at the end of this hall. And we'll see you back here at 1025.